Yeah, I'll wait. I'll wait another minute. But that's it. Yeah. 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 Það eru hérna Can we load can we load the first one up? The first presenter? Yeah. Christine's up so that what she Það eru krakkar sem að eru Það eru krakkar sem eru í doktorsnámi sem eru þust koma fram og eru bara this is her. It's hers. Yeah. Yeah. She just left the room. You've got thirty seconds. So I can throw some stuff I won't be here that long. <laughs> our, our first speaker just left for a minute. <laughs> it's kind of hard to start. <laughs> oh, well, now it's getting way too complicated. Yep, it's going strong. Okay. Then it's okay. Okay. All right. Good afternoon and welcome to the 11th session, Exploring Methods for the Adaptation to Climate Change. And I would like to apologize in advance to the presenters for any mispronunciations of their names. Please forgive me. Um, our first speaker today is Christine Thora Arindatia. <laughs> she is a nurse and a lecturer at the School of Health of Sciences, University of Akureyri. Her practical and research interests are patient participation, elderly care, and rehabilitation. She has mainly used the qualitative methods in her research, phenomenology, ethnography, and action research. Action research is particular, of particular interest to her in which theory and practice are integrated. Christine is also a doctoral student at the University of Iceland and is going to talk about 
Can action research act as a vehicle in climate change adaptation? Uh, good day. Uh, and uh, I will first begin to, to thank for this opportunity to, de to discuss action research as a methodology in climate change adaptation. Uh, well, I'm not a specialist in clim climate change, but I found I, I've learned a lot during this uh, preparation for this presentation and also on the conference. And, uh, and uh, primarily, I will, of course, discuss the methodology and frame it into climate change adaptation. Uh, yes. Well, first a little methodolo methodologi methodological uh, review. Uh, we are talking about action research, but action research is like other kind of research. Uh, it's a research and is uh, primary of primary purpose of, of creating new knowledge. But uh, if you can see research, it's a systematic invest investigation for new knowledge and understanding grounding, grounded on established methods of data collection, methods and data analysis. Finding ways of testing its validity and sharing the knowledge for specific purposes. Uh, this all applies for action research. Uh, but in action research, this purposes are always to do with learning, personal growth, and social growth. This is not all, in, not, doesn't apply in all other kinds of research. Uh, yeah, it's more okay. Well, uh, okay, here it is. Uh, the action research is a uh, action research uh, is not new, and it has been developed a big family uh, around action research and different approaches and such, which I'm not going to touch upon, especially. But the action research approach I'm, I'm taking in this presentation is influenced by constructivism, that is, knowledge is built but not acquired, and people have to interpret their uh, experiences to make knowledge of, to make sense of it, and that's their knowledge. Uh, it's also influenced uh, by critical theory and friary, which I will maybe uh, discuss in context, but. The paradigm of critical theory is, involves the integration of theory and practice, and it is critical. It's critical society, and the assumptions uh, in, in the dominated assumptions in their society, which can inhabit uh, social and individual growth. Uh, it uh, emphasizes self-awareness, awareness of uh, develop awareness of these assumptions that inhibits growth and uh, make and, and leads to oppression and there is um, emancipatory em em <laughs> uh, effects. In Friary, in this line, the, he is his uh, theory, uh, main, main theory is about the empowering act of the dialogue by the dialogue and reflection that uh, people can uh, came, uh, become aware of, of uh, uh, come aware of and and, and, and of uh, issues that constrain them, and and they're, they're, and, and by this conscious raising and reflection, they develop knowledge which is important for them, meaningful, and they can act upon, used to act upon. This is uh, I'm, use, I'm I'm discussing uh, community-based research particularly. Uh, and it's uh, the and I'm actually very in line with the participatory action research called PAR line. <laughs> well, uh, 
the qualities of action research, what makes it, what make it actually different from other kinds of research, is, is that it integrates research and this change process, processes. And there's actually a, a research on the change process involved in the research itself, and thus uh, uh, knowledge developed during this change process. It focuses on learning and reflection, learning by experience. Uh, it's collaborative. We are researching with people, not on people. Uh, research some issue together with people which they have input into. It aims at improvements. All question uh, questions in action research begin with how to how do we improve, how can we improve this, how, and so on. Uh, uh, it intentionally political and empowering, as I've been. It's, it has, has to do with power and change, uh, uh, and uh, empowering the vulnerable people and and uh, freeing them from oppression. Well, it's an ethical enterprise, which all action, uh, action research are, of course. But this is a particularly ethical uh, research, I would say. Uh, that we are very closely related to people, we are researching with them, and we are involved in enhancing changes that can uh, impact their lives. So uh, I, this, uh, well, I find this very ethical, and and I think most people say so. But uh, I don't have time for for uh, uh, talking about the outcomes principles, which is actually the principles I have uh, been working with, which I suppose many of you know, the association of Kennedy, what is it? <laughs> well, it's just, no, I don't have it here. Y yes, for Northern Studies, okay, yes. <laughs> I ho hope you, somebody, know about Akuns, but I have been, in my doctoral study, I have been using these ethical uh, guidelines, and they have been very helpful, and I will discuss them later on if you are interested. Well, this is data feedback and cyclical, cyclical process and, di and data, multi-data collection. Uh, the action research cycle can be uh, described differently, but I found this very, very descriptive and appropriate. Uh, with, uh, we are en engaging with the real world, the real setting, we define the issue, and therefore we have to make data collection, in initial observation, and the existing data, and then we have to analyze those data and reflect upon them, upon them. Then we plan actions, implement those actions, and then analyze the intervention, and, and, and then we begin on another cycle. What has happened? What, how, what, what has changed? And how is the situation now? And this can involve many cycles, and, you, and usually it's several cycles that we have to do with to make the change sustainable. The, it's a multi-data collection. I think I will not go read it through, but actually you can read it <laughs> and see it's actually, in fact, everything can count as data. But uh, usually, of course, the researcher uses journaling and self-reflective journaling. This is focus groups, interviewing, participant observation, and all kind of op data collection, quantitative and qualitative, to make uh, to to make uh, what uh, to observe the initial situation, and then research the plan, uh, uh, research the intervention. Well, uh, then we come to the point while, while I'm because uh, yeah, uh, for the reason I'm here, why is action research suitable, suitable in adaptation to climate change? Actually, there are so much consumerability in this uh, in these acts, if you one could say so. Uh, well, it's a change. Adaptation is a complex process. Change process requires learning and learning from experience. It aims at community improvements and uh, requires collaboration. Uh, people are vulnerable, as we can say, of course, of course in, in decision, decision people or local people, and everybody is, uh, they are very vulnerable to local change, to climate change. And it's very important to value their local knowledge and, and collaboration for, for uh, for, of course, improving their lives and, 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 and uh, executing their, I would just talk of human rights and uh, self-determination. 
and it's very ethical actually. And this is well, I'm, I'm uh, what I have read through. So you can see there is very much comparability between these facts. So I will see and just and and, and uh, then we have to relate relate this. Uh, Climate change is global, should stand here. <laughs> uh, well, uh, when I was uh, searching for global change adaptation and participatory action research, I only found actually participatory, uh, only found uh, published studies that have been studied in, who had been conducted in Africa, actually, in uh, Ghana and uh, Zimbabwe. And uh, there, there is a problem is drought and uh, the uh, loss of rain, uh, diminished rain, and which leads to uh, food uh, diminished sup food supplies. And I've just I have just touched very uh, on the central points of this study. Uh, well, we, here, here I have the the, the uh, cycle, the action research cycle. I'm going to relate that to this study. And this is actually a study by, it's actually very recent. Um, and uh, if you come to uh, the engagement of the situation, real situation, which is uh, was food security was threatened due to climate change and the uh, crop yield diminished. And uh, uh, in context, uh, from 1960 to 2008, there was 30% decline in rainy days. Now there were Include increase in droughts and uh, tenure between farmers because of the yield, uh, the diminished yield, uh, local farmers and migrant farmers, uh, diminished soil fertility. This was all at the beginning with every, well, well it was uh, that the situation came up with. Uh, uh, participants were very many, they don't tell me in this article, but uh, there was this research team, farmers with different responsibility, farmers who uh, 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 yes, intervened in a, in a different, uh, purpose, different purposes, I will tell you later on. There were farmers association, local leaders, and there were methodologists, methodologists, agriculturists, fertilizers companies, and so on. Well, uh, defining the issue, uh, which was initial observation and existing data. This was, as in action research, a multifocal uh, collection, uh, begun with literature review on the subject. And then, as you can uh, uh, imagine, there were, there were measurements of uh, uh, fertil uh, soil fertility analysis, for example, the crop yields and such, weather and, and so on. Um, and, and, and also group interviews. But what, we came, what uh, the group came up to, the focus group involved in all these uh, stakeholders, were that, surprisingly to me actually, that's maybe the dec declining soil fertility was the core of the problem. Well, I thought I was always waiting for rain, <laughs> which was, of course, uh, the soil fertility was diminished because of the rain. But this was the uh, focal point. And uh, action planning. How do we uh, how how do we pl plan? How's the planning? How for how are we going to plan for for increased soil fertility? Uh, this was actually very interesting. There were uh, a, a learning centers established, uh, which involved uh, experimentation of integrated soil fertility for, for soil fertility management. Uh, where uh, a group of uh, farmers participated and they made experiments with different uh, fertil fertil fertilizers, both organic and, and uh, also uh, non-organic, so some nitrogen and such, and, and a different be better feed and rotation of crop and such. And uh, there was one season that this experiment series were going on with these farmers participating. And uh, there were actually, the results were remarkable. There was so much increase in, in group yields. And uh, the next plan, but we, then there was another action cycle, 
and uh, uh, and uh, then the, these farmers, as uh, peer, uh, as a kind of peer <laughs> uh, evaluator, uh, they they went to the community, to the participating farmer there who wanted to participate and talked about this and showed them and had plays and whatever, just to get them interested in this uh, 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 increase in, in crop yields and, and asked them to participate, uh, which some of them did. And after maybe the final analysis of the in-study, the, the main conclusions that the experimental showed increase in soil fertility and crop yields I have simply seen, and also, what was interesting, that increasing uh, of crop yields were up to 25 to 125 percent in, in the community, real life. That's, that's very high. Uh, so you could say it was, in, in fact, well, in that successful in that, uh, uh, if you look at that like that. But uh, then we have to re-engage with the situation. They were interested in this uh, integrated soil fertility management by farmer, of course. But uh, increased soil fertility still developed challenges. challenges. And, uh, well, the challenges were that the migrant farmers who were from other countries, uh, the local farmers, uh, well, they just wanted, they, they, uh, wanted their land now because it was so productive. So it was tension there. And also, uh, there, uh, because of this increased yield, the, the, uh, the farmers uh, had to pay more tax. So, uh, so we are, the study is regarded as an entry, entry point where to begin with, and we had to begin with the political and all stakeholders to continue the process. So, this was uh, interesting. Uh, lecture for me actually, but I know the situation is quite different here in the Arctic. Uh, well, in, in in floods and and melting of ice and and the relocations and uh, terrible uh, uh, disaster uh, situations. But however, uh, I would like to I have to ask you the question: uh, uh, Is it feasible to go into the action cycle? in the north, and can it be a change in climate change adaptation? Yep. We have a, a few minutes for questions. If there are none, we can go on to the next speaker, and then we'll have a we'll have some time at the end as well to ask both speakers. Uh, okay. Some questions. Thank you. Thank you. Now, let's see if I can get this straight. <laughs> There's been some shuffling of the last of the program here. You have uh, Dr. Olaf Foss, who is a sociologist, senior researcher, and former research director at the Norwegian Institute for urban and regional research in Oslo listed as the speaker, but he won't be the speaker. It will be one of his colleagues. It will be uh, Dr. Uva Nongiland, <laughs> who is also a sociologist and working as a senior researcher uh, at the Norwegian Institute for Urban and Regional Research. Then there is a third author, Bjorg Langset, who, uh, who uh, she is also an economist and senior researcher at the uh, um, Norwegian Institute for uh, Regional Research. And Dr. and I'm going to try this again. <laughs> Langi Land. Okay. <laughs> we'll talk to us. Uh, about methodolo methodological challenges in multidisciplinary climate change research experiences from uh, uh, Espon climate. Thank you. <clears throat> See if I can change this first. Uh, escape, maybe, no. Maybe some assistance. 
Yes. <clears throat> Thank you very much. <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> I said um, methodological changes, yeah, in multidisciplinary climate change research. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> this is from a social science perspective. <clears throat> and we were working in this more natural science oriented project and that was a challenge which I'm going to give some comments to <clears throat> and uh, the experience will drawn, be drawn from this Espen climate project but uh, I will not give a detailed information about that project but just use it as a background <clears throat> so it's, it will be a point of departure for, for the methodological discussion <clears throat> yes <clears throat> and in, in this deals with regional development and in, in that matter uh, dealing with climate change is, is rather very important <clears throat> and in this Espen project we looked at it, the title was Territorial Effects on Regions and Local Economies in Europe <clears throat> so it was a, a social scientific focus but based on changes in the nature <clears throat> And uh, since regional vulnerability vary, as we do know, as we know it, I do, it do, does, so also territorial adaptation or mitigation strategies must vary. <clears throat> and that's a challenge in how to, to uh, first to make prediction and to make possible measures to, to do something with it. <clears throat> I think I can use the arrows now. No. This is the. This is also a challenge. I just have to point at the arrows, I suppose. No, but nothing happened. <clears throat> can I, can, get can I use this one? Or no. I, I did that too as well. No, I think you just. Maybe I'll show you. Okay, now Seems that the presentation will end here. <laughs> <laughs> I leave no, the rest I to your imagination. <clears throat> but you, you, you just did use yes. this one, yeah? yeah? Maybe it's uh, it's only female fingers that yes. <laughs> it could be something there. <laughs> That's very strange. There was a point I made. Yeah. Yes, there came up a new arrow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Then we can go on. <clears throat> yes. Um, just a few words about the, the background and the purpose of the Espen project. <clears throat> As I said, it was mainly about the, the uh, making a pan European vulnerability as assessment, which should be a basis for identifying the, the regional topologies of climate change exposure sensitivity, impact, and vulnerability. <clears throat> and out of this, one should make, and, and I quote, tailor-made adaptation options should be derived. <clears throat> so it was a very ambitious aim, target. And uh, to, to be able to cope with regionally specific pattern of climate change. So there should be a kind of, um, of guidelines or a handbook or whatever you like. To, to how to deal with climate change effects. <clears throat> and uh, I could also mention that we, we didn't use, only use statistical data for, for the, the whole of Europe, but also made some case studies where you can more go into details when it comes to the regional specificity. <clears throat> yeah, I will, I will not go into these things. Uh, <clears throat> just like to give you a glimpse of the, 
of the model we used. <clears throat> this one, yeah. <clears throat> I think I have to put on my glasses. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> this, is a, this is a very common and, and, and widely used uh, framework within the climate change research. It's adapted from Fussell and Klein. <clears throat> And it's, it's starting up, as you can see, with the, with the greenhouse gas emissions contributing to global warming and, and thus to climate change. And there is also this kind of climate variability, which is very in parallel. And the, uh, the resulting climate change differ between regions, as said, and each and every region has a different exposure to the climate change. <clears throat> in addition, as said, it has different uh, distinct physical, environmental, social, cultural, and economic characteristics. That's the context of the different region, of course. <clears throat> and which all results in different sensitivities to climate change. <clears throat> so together then, this model will say that the exposure and sensitivity determine, deter, determine the possible impacts of climate change which, which impact it might have on a region. <clears throat> but as we all know, a region can do something, can adapt in the meantime, and depending on its adaptive capacity, <clears throat> the, the, um, the, the impacts can be, can be changed. <clears throat> and or finally, it's the, mean the, the, the final and overall vulnerability will, will be different due to the adaptive capacity. This is in very short the model we, we went we were based on, the, the project were based on. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so, and we literally said was put into that model as social scientists. <clears throat> and that was a, a problem, that was a challenge. <clears throat> and, uh, and that's what I like to say something about today. <clears throat> uh, we sorted it in three different aspects, <clears throat> the challenges related to, um, <clears throat> to the multidisciplinarity as such, <clears throat> and to time perspectives and predictions, and also some final comments on the, <clears throat> and that's more on the time dimension, yes, and finally on the more, the geographical scale, the maps and, and aggregated data, and so on. <clears throat> <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> yeah, I'm I'm starting with this one just in order to. <clears throat> this was a, a model or a we used in another project in an interreg project called Baltica, <clears throat> where we we also said that yeah, multidisciplinarity in climate research is necessary. The, the question and the and the challenges is how to do it in a proper way how to mix different disciplines. <clears throat> and uh, in, in this, uh, just to go very quickly through it, we also said, I, I, um, <clears throat> we said we took the basis, we started also out with global warming. <clears throat> and we said that, uh, and, and it, this is very linear, of course, the reality is not like that, but just for in order to make it simple. <clears throat> and then we say that the next step in the model is the downscaling of global effects into to regional or local effects. The next, yeah, and, and, and both these two first steps are more or less top-down focused, oriented. <clears throat> and, and the third step <clears throat> is, um, is, is when you start looking at impacts on natural and built environments, and on the fourth step, on social and economic activities in society, as we should do in the Espen climate, <clears throat> then you have to introduce other kind of knowledge and expertise than you do in the first two in the first two um, stages there, or steps. <clears throat> so, um, and, 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 and in a way, then you had, then is the question how to, what should, how, how should the interplay be between these, uh, these um, different uh, disciplines and, and, um, and approaches? <clears throat> I just have to take a quick look at my papers here. <clears throat> Yes, and I could say that in the in the Espon climate project, and due to that model I showed you before, we felt that we as social scientists were more or less forced into a 
let me put it like this, a natural science straitjacket in a way. <clears throat> and that, that made quite a lot of, of, um, of, of problems during the, during the project. <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> we, when we started out in the project, we, we were thinking about how can we look into the economic effects on regions and local economies. <clears throat> started out looking in, into climate change effects that were directly on, on uh, production and consumption. This was particularly agriculture, aquaculture, fishery, forestry, tourism, etc. <clears throat> and then going down to looking into, or we should do, climate change effects indirectly on production and consumption. For example, less tourism leads to reduced needs for services in a region, etc. <clears throat> and it could also be uh, climate change uh, effects, economic effects, due to changes or, or destroy if, if, in, or an infrastructure, built environments and so on. <clears throat> or it could have an overall effect on, on agglomerations or cities or things like that. That would have been a, <clears throat> that would have been a, a more natural way to look at, into it from, a, from, a, from an economic point of view in, in social science. But we didn't do that. We were, we, were, we were constrained to look only because we had nine exposure variables temperature, precipitation, etc., etc., and we should measure the direct effect on these things. And the economy was singled out as, a, as one sensitivity <clears throat> sector, and physical another one, and social a third one, although we know that if things happening in, in the social sector, it will, will have economic effects. Or if a bridge is falling down or a road is taken, okay, that's a physical effect, yes, but it's also an economic effect. But we didn't look at these things. We ended up looking at these fishery soils and things, and, we, and we, <clears throat> we had to look into what's going to happen if precipitation or frost or whatever it is affects the soil. Depends on it's 30 or 60 cent centimeter deep. And we have no idea about soil at all. We don't know anything about soil. So <clears throat> this was just to give you a very small glimpse of, of what we what we have to, have to struggle with. <clears throat> um, yeah, I think the worst thing was that when we had a discussion about the soil depth, 30 or 60 centimeters. <clears throat> um, yes. <clears throat> uh, yeah, uh, a few words about also the, um, this, the, the problem related or the challenge it's more, it's more positive to say challenge than a problem, isn't it? So, <clears throat> um, related to the time perspective and, and, and the quest for prediction. <clears throat> and as we know that climate change is, it's, it's, we're talking about very long changes. Decades, hundreds of years. <clears throat> and, and, and if you should try to, to, to use social science in that connection, it's, it's not easy. Prediction in social science is, is possible. Yes, of course, we do a lot of predictions on short term. We call it long term when it's 10 to 15 years maybe. <clears throat> but we're not talking about 50, 100, 200 years, <clears throat> which we should do in, the, in, the, in, uh, in this project. <clears throat> um, yeah, so, so that the, um, <clears throat> the problem was here that we, we had this data from the climate models going up to 2100. But we lack the data, of course, on the social science side of it. There, there is a project also within Espen Demifair, which had projected the demographic development until 2100. Well, it's possible to do it, of course. You can make, you can extrapolate, I mean, anything you like, but does it make sense? <clears throat> and if you try to downscale it into different regions, it's, uh, and if you take, the, and that's only one one variable if you take a lot of other things. So <clears throat> it's, um, yeah, as, as, as I see it, and uh, most social scientists I know see it, making predictions for 100 years ahead, that's, uh, well, it, it might be fun, but it doesn't make sense. 
Um, what I what I think is that if one should do some kind of um, fruitful speculation, let me call it that, <clears throat> I, I think it could be it could be that the scenario working or foresight could be a more proper method. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Yeah, I'd like to read to you the, uh, a citation from the report of Jesper Climate first because uh, there was a really uh, there was a strong worry about not having these data 100 years ahead in social and social aspects, saying that without the dynamic social economic sensitivity indicators, any climate change impact or vulnerability assessment is fraught with a great weakness that one can only relate to dynamic future oriented climate data to static social sensitivity data. <clears throat> yeah, that, of course that was the dilemma. <clears throat> but and is then the, well, what's then the repercy for, for doing something with it? Should we make similar predictions? <clears throat> or should we do something else? I think I would go for something else. <clears throat> and, and then I said that it could be that, that scenarios or foresight could be Alternative future research. <clears throat> I think one of the one of the thing with scenario and foresight is that starting out with saying it, it's not predictions. <clears throat> the the assumption is that the future is more or less unpredictable. <clears throat> I mean, think we were supposed to say something about effects on local and regional economies in year two thousand one hundred, and and the economy in one two thousand one hundred, we have no idea what it's going to look like. It will be different from today, of course, but what's it going to look like, we don't know anything about. <clears throat> That's why I said that, that this scenario maybe could be, could be a different way of, because then you, you are constructing more or less plausible stories <clears throat> uh, of paths to the future, and you can identify driving forces and, and try to, to combine these forces in, in logical change. <clears throat> And, and generate more a range of outcomes, not single outcomes, but a range of outcomes. And the point is not hitting the target as such, but to make a, to make a, a basis for the discussion, what can happen and what can we do. <clears throat> and I also like to add that a, a good scenario is, is a scenario that is internally consistent. I mean, you have to do very scientific oriented work. You have to do statistical analysis. You have to to qualitative judgments of these and so on and so on. <clears throat> um, and uh, an internally consistent hypothesis, yeah, about how the future might unfold. So it's a, ch it's a chain of logic that connects drivers to different outcomes. <clears throat> I think that could be a, a more suitable way. <clears throat> then you can ask, what is happening? Why does it happen? How do the driving forces affect different actors? <clears throat> In, in the, and what implication does it have for societies, different sectors or <clears throat> areas in societies? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, this was just to show <clears throat> very, very quickly, <clears throat> this, this was one of the maps we produced, potential economic impact of climate change, showing that it's, it's worse in the south than in the north. Due to, uh, on, but most of the economy is outside of this map. I mean, this is just the fishery and forestry and, and things like that, which are directly uh, affected. So most of the, of the total economy is just out of it. It consists of very small sectors of the economy. And it's, it's on a very aggregated level. <clears throat> and and I, I, would, I would imagine it's not much use for a planner to see it. <clears throat> Um, since time is short, I just uh, yeah jump to the conclusion. <clears throat> um, and I think the I, I just ended up with having a, with a, some more questions than fixed answers, of course. <clears throat> and it is, I think the, it absolutely is a necessity to have multidisciplinarity when you're dealing with climate change. <clears throat> So the question is how to achieve optimal, <clears throat> well, 
It, it, it's, it's, a, but it, it's a very important question to discuss between the different disciplines, how to do it. <clears throat> and, uh, and secondly, you really have to, to take seriously this question, in what way and how is it or is it possible to predict the future in social sciences? <clears throat> I mean, it is. It is back to the, back to the, uh, the old, the, the the difference between the nature and society. There are different disciplines for these things. We need have them to collaborate, but how? And that's a, that's a very big challenge. I have no good good answer to it, but maybe we, I think that should be discussed much more within the in the community. <clears throat> and and then then there is the following up on a practical implication of that which kind of climate research is most helpful for spatial planning? If you like to do something, if something seriously is taking place, what can we do? And then, you, of course, we need, then we need knowledge, information, facts, and, and at least not, and, and quite a lot of discussions. I was listening to, um, to, uh, to Eric Lerschen today this morning. He said that uh, the, uh, he was talking about the, the qualitative understanding of quantitative facts. I think that's a, that's a, an interesting way to, to see it, and also the uh, the, <clears throat> the keynote sp uh, speech from from Jun yesterday about the the adaptive planning, and I think both these things direct to the to the stakeholder involvement and dialogues. That's more a procedural thing, but of course it is also very important. It is actually a question about how to combine different types of knowledge and, and make that into a kind of a democratic discussion. Thank you. We're running a little bit behind time, but we still have uh, the time for a few questions for our speakers. Do I see anyone that has any questions? Eric? Do we have a microphone, or I think we're... No, we don't need a microphone. Okay. okay. But just as a brief paradox, you talk about predictions and the usefulness. Paradox is just if you look at demographic forecasts, they can be quite exact, maybe at a 20, 30 year perspective. We know reasonably well what is happening, demographically speaking, but policies don't take proper account. I mean, we don't have a, on some aspects of we're starting to wake up on retirement and some aspects maybe, but we still see that there is a very insufficient and very insufficient capacity of policymakers to take in what we do know about the future. And at the same time, they would like to they would like us to make predictions about what we cannot know. And I just, no, I just a paradox, maybe have some comments on, on, on this paradox on our relationship to the future, what we know and what we don't know about the future. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think that's a very interesting comment. Uh, as you say, they, they're asking for predictions on things we cannot know and things we, that we know more about anyway. They don't do anything. I think it's, it's about politics. I mean, four years is a very long time in politics. Very long time. We have an we have we have, have an election in next next month, and then it is four years to the next parliamentary election. I mean, this is a really long term in, in political perspectives. <clears throat> and and when we are talking about here doing adaptation and mitigation measures, we're talking about. I've been studying in Bergen the, uh, the the sea level rise there. They said that it could be up to one meter maybe, but we don't have to do anything before 2050. <coughs> oh my God. We don't have to think about that today. I mean, it's a long, long time. Ago. And, and I mean, but the roads and the kindergartens and all these things are standing there waiting for money and, and, uh, and decisions. <clears throat> so I mean, this is a, it, how to implement, how to make politicians take, take decisions that should, should deal about 40, 50, or 100 years ahead. Is it, is it possible? <laughs> <laughs> Try to. End this. Maybe they have to. Maybe they have to put themselves in a kind of a straitjacket. Yeah. yeah, on some on some dimension, say that okay. There is a, no no. The whole, all of the parties agree that for the next forty years we do like that. Yeah. We have a question up there. Just one more point concerning uncertainty. If you look back, there is one more aspect that is about this. If you look back, we see all the innovation that we put people couldn't have seen before they were there, and which completely have changed things. <coughs> For example, the economists at the end of the last 19th century mm -hmm. made calculations how long time it would take before the horse manure would be one meter thick in the street plant. 
that's, that's the classical example. Yeah. The London will be buried in, <laughs> in horse shit. Yeah. Yeah. And we know that don't happen. And that's why. Happen. What? No, we didn't. Happen. No, of course not. And that's why we can't. Uh, we can't say something about effects on local economies in 2100 because we have no no idea at all what it's going to look like. I mean, things are changing all the time. So yeah. Yes. yes. Excuse me, just a really brief comment when we're talking about the sometimes the possibility of forecasting, but um, some of the research I've looked at has discarded that and now talks about that casting. In other words, where do we want to be in the years and the years, and what, that, what does that mean then that we have to do that? Mm. And uh, perhaps that's something. Yeah, I think that's that's one of the that one of the methods within the scenario and foresight thinking also yes. forecast and backcast. And you say, okay, let's say in 2100 we'd like to be there. Mm. And what do we have to looking back? What do we have to do then in order to to reach that target? Yeah. So I think we can combine a lot of these different methods. And in all these, uh, this is also based on quite a lot of research, of course, mm. um, quantitative research and qualitative and all kinds. So it's. Uh, it's not a non-scientific approach. No, it isn't. I have a, a question if nobody else has one. I was kind of interested uh, with your comment saying that you were forced into a virtual science straitjacket. Uh, I was wondering if, if you could tell us a little bit of the reasoning why you felt that and also whether you felt it skewed some of your results having to get into some of we felt that because this this model was the that was the model for the project, and we when we were not able to look at let's say the, let's take these sensitivity uh, dimensions. They said physical, social, economic, environmental, but we say that yeah, but maybe economy that's a more second order effect. If there is real big physical damages, bridges, roads, tunnels are destroyed. It will, of course, have economic effects. <clears throat> you have to rebuild them, you have to do something like that. If things happen in, in, in the social area, it's the similar way. <clears throat> but we were not able to, to uh, within this model, we were not able to discuss that because we had a range of nine exposure variables, precipitation, extreme uh, uh, heavy rain, etc., etc., temperature, and so on. And we should take a direct line from one of these exposure until effects. And that's why we ended up looking into, as I said, the, uh, the marginal economic sectors. And we ended also up sitting, discussing how will the effect be on the soil if it's 30 or 60 centimeters. And we had to be honest and say, sorry, we don't know anything about soil. <laughs> so that, that, in the results. <laughs> no, it was very difficult to, to make, uh, and, and if we should do a really proper economic judgment of these, of course, you probably need much more uh, sophisticated models as well, so it was. But I think we could have handled it in another way, maybe, maybe more within. Uh, I mean, also the climate scenarios are also scenarios. We could have, we could have maybe done some social science scenarios focusing on economic aspects. I think that could have been better. <clears throat> so, so I was wondering if it was just a time constraint on, on being able to develop your own models. Or? Yeah, in a way, yes. <clears throat> Any other questions? I'm just sort of curious of how you stumbled on Aiken's ethical guidelines principles. Uh, yes, yeah, so well, one of my supervisors is actually uh, on the book. Uh, he was on the book. He was on the book. He was on the book. He was on the Let's try to get back here by 3.20.
All right, good afternoon and welcome to the second half of session 11, Exploring Methods for Adaptation to Climate Change. I understand that uh, Janice Collins from the University of Latvia won't be joining us today, so we're going to move on to our next speaker, which is Dr. Eric Clarsen, who is a senior consultant from Norway, but is working for Spatial Foresight in Paris. Lucky guy. <laughs> he is also a researcher and a lecturer of economic geography at the University of Geneva. He previously worked for the Nordic Research Center on Territorial Development, Nordregio, in Stockholm. Two years ago, he led a foresight exercise in the rural community of Iceland, Greenland, and the Faroe Islands, funded by the Nordic Council of Ministers Arctic Cooperation Program. He, is all, he has also been working in the Epson Geospec project on development opportunities in areas with geographic specific specificities and of the st strategy development process for the Alpine Space Program. Eric's presentation is about using foresight to trigger entrepreneurship and growth in West Nordic rural communities. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. I think that was the second time you had that one. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. See if I can get this working. Okay. Um, you also, actually, some of you may have had Greta's presentation earlier about uh, Fjallabygd and Borgarbygd uh, foresight. So this will be a bit, this is a part of the same project. So I will be more general focusing on how, how this project was um, Running why it was initiated and what were what the objectives were. Um, we heard a lot about dialogue, um, about the importance of of, of uh, engaging communities. Uh, Patricia Cochrane mentioned it this yesterday about how we need to create a dialogue. Um, also about the need to engage in the wider to expand these ambitions, perspectives for these territories, to put them into, to, to, to communicate them in a wider context. But maybe um, one tends to take a bit too much for granted the fact that a dialogue is, okay, bring people together, um, let them talk. Um, and especially working with rural communities and fragile position that are exposed to many external constraints and challenges, it's not that easy. It's not as if you can just take them out of this community and say, okay, what do you want? Tell, give them a microphone. What's your opinion? Maybe that was a bit of the starting point here. Um, another source of inspiration, which is interesting, is that to see that this is really a result of Nordic cooperation, because the starting point was that the, Nord the, Nordics, the northern sparsely populated areas of um, Go to the next here. The northern sparsely populated areas of Norway, Sweden, and Finland uh, started with the foresight process. Uh, this was in 2005, if I remember correctly. And from their perspective, their perspective was there is a reform. There was a new structural funds programming period coming, and they needed to try to get up a, a position uh, in relation to the European Union, explaining why European policies for their areas would be justified, and trying to say, well, we. We're not just asking for money because it's, we, you should feel pity for us. We, we think that you could invest in our areas because we can deliver something. And the foresight process was about getting that message of what would we deliver? What do we want to do? What's our ambition? What could we do with appropriate policies? So this was really what inspired now the West Nordic communities to try to apply similar types of methodologies. So what, the objective is really to test whether these types of foresight methods going from as you know, the North Swedish Finnish regions and big regional institutions bringing together then mostly senior officials into office and now moving this into West Nordic villages, many of them quite small ones, and how do we transfer methods of foresight from these different types of audiences? How do we use them with, with people that are not used to the policy discussions and all these types of, of processes? 
Um, we wanted also to identify how these and the local stakeholders, how they identify development challenges, how they look at their own future, what is their ambition, where they, they, would they like to be, and comparing perceptions. So we, we're getting back to that. We, have a, we had a multi-level. So how do we compare perspectives at the local, national, and transnational levels? Yeah, so the three-level approach, um, basically we, we, then st we wanted to start at the local level organizing these workshops and bring together the results from these workshops at a higher, at a national level, discuss again to so see if the perspective bringing in national stakeholders would be different if they fits, and then again bring that to a transnational level and, and trying to extract what would be, uh, what could be transnational measures in relation to these aspirations at the, lo at the local level. A first interesting uh, point is to see that while you think local, you think community, maybe village, and you realize that when you go into the uh, different countries, this means very different things. Um, villages did functioned as a unit in Greenland, where it's really, that's the scale at which things are happening. But if you move to the Faroe Islands, it appears much more natural to use islands. So these um, the, the island was a natural unit to bring together stakeholders. And in Iceland, it would be municipalities. This already shows that you, you adapting this method and thinking the local as a local can be quite different things. Then our cases that were mentioned by Greta earlier, then they were uh, then the islands of Sunday and Suderoy in f the Faroe Islands, uh, Borgarbygd, Fatlabygd in, in Iceland, and the two villages of Ikarasaka and Akunak in Greenland. Um, let me show them on the... So, um, starting maybe from the last... Akunak, if we let you see here, <laughs> it's a village of 100 inhabitants, and the nearest town is Asia, which has 3,150. The only connection between those two places is about 23 kilometers, and there is only a seasonal ferry. So basically, the only way of getting there is your own boat, most of the time, or for our workshop purposes, a helicopter. But that's the accessibility. Um, Ikerasak, which is um, which I, uh, here. <laughs> um, is, has 250 inhabitants, and the, the closest uh, town was Umanak with 1,400 inhabitants. There with a regular ferry connection. By comparison, of course, um, Borgarbygd in Iceland has uh, 3,500 inhabitants, um, falling population uh, up um, currently after a strong increase up to 2008. Um, Fjatlabygd, which is then an hour from here, has um, 2,000 inhabitants, a bit over 2,000, and has been declining since the, for many decades. The Faroe Islands of Sandoy uh, has 13, a bit over 1,300 inhabitants and is within commuting distance of Tushan, while Suthurai, and the southernmost here, has... Um, has 4,800 inhabitants, but is then beyond commuting distance from the ferries mainland. Just to give you the quickly the framework. So what what is then foresight about about about? Well, what we're looking for is really to enable stakeholders to look ahead in a constructive way. So. How can we make them through bringing together a group? How can we make them look, project themselves in the future? Um, how can we help them describing a range of scenarios together? Identifying what are the oppositions and what are the shared ambitions in a group? So ideally transforming what would be a latent consensus, a uh, non-expressed consensus into an explicit position. And more generally contributing to making strategic action possible. This is done by gathering, ideally, a representative group of stakeholders and applying a series of methods to make an open, balanced, and maybe, importantly, time-efficient dialogue possible. So we have a number of different methods then that um, were developed um, to work with these groups. If 
side. Yeah, this were just to make this a little bit less abstract. Some pictures from the Greenland uh, workshops. I believe this was in Akunak. Um, so types of groupings that were then organized, but. Um, this is already what you see here is already the output of quite a long process, um, enabling the workshop leader, that, whose back you see there, um, to get in, have a whole dialogue about what would be the methods. How do you approach a village? How do you go into having a dialogue from our perspective of foresight methods that we have been applying at regional level with cities, with totally different contexts, and trying to work with him on how would you then come into a Greenlandic village in a quite fragile position, persons that are absolutely not used to being asked about the, what, how they see their future. Uh, how do you approach that? How do you adapt the method? What would be the best method among different types of, of uh, foresight uh, interaction methods? And how do you report that? So just to give some examples, he had a whole process before they started of trying to get in conf get a relationship of trust coming in the day before, having some small talk, having even, he had singing, he, they were singing together, things like that which may seem uh, quite uh, exotic or unusual from our usual foresight perspective, which became very necessary to get into uh, a discussion process in, that, in those villages. Um, so just some uh, pictures of, of how these processes very concretely then took place. Um, seeing the, the grouping, the group dynamic in this. Of course, if I had, I could have, I haven't taken it, pictures of all the different workshops. As you, as you can imagine, the workshop, uh, the way in which they were carried out in an Icelandic municipality or a Faroese island would then again quite different. So different methods, depending on previous experience, also some of these, the Icelandics, for example, they had a, had a whole national process looking ahead before. Uh, these local workshops, so they had a whole other culture of, of, of handling this. So they could work in different groups, be more accustomed to being uh, to focusing on different themes. Um, we then accumulated these different local results and uh, used them in national workshop. When when possible, we included the local stakeholders with the objective of identifying multi-level governance perspectives. Um, and then again, we brought this together, as I mentioned, in the transnational uh, workshop, once again taking up the local stakeholders, bringing it together and seeing how this could feed into a transnational perspective. Briefly, what were the results? Um, the workshop first confirmed that there is very insufficient dialogue um, based on the local community's own perception of opportunities and challenges, which is quite striking because if you look at all the dialogue, all the questions we have about foresight and these processes in larger units, larger cities, the issue is always, well, it's too complex. It's too complex to organize. There are too many stakeholders, too many perspectives. We can't do this. But when you arrive in a situation as these villages where it is possible, it is not being done. So there is quite a paradox there that the, very, the comparative advantage of these communities is not exploited. And that's very striking to see. We're not using uh, the, the one, the most important strength we have in these areas. We also found that a wealth of ideas and suggestions, that's maybe the challenge for me now presenting this to you, is that I could spend hours, basically. We have a, quite a report which is, which is available online, but all the ideas that came up of how, what could be done better, there was so much input coming out and so many points that didn't really raise, at least not in the workshops as we organized, and there was no st big political debate. These were not um, disputed elements, quite consensual position locally about what could be done. And uh, um, generally a shared awareness in these different, all these different case studies, uh, case study areas of the unique qualities of the living environment on the one side, but often a contradiction between these, this awareness, this idea, we are proud of be being where we are, we think this is a high quality living environment, but uh, for my children, I would still like them to go into the larger town, I think they would have a better future. And this, this contradiction is quite a, a constant in, in many of the, of the discussion, which makes it maybe complicated to project themselves in a the future for these areas, because, well, they think for, for the group, but not for their own their own family, or maybe, maybe even for themselves. They, it's a different perspective. 
we could identify through the workshop series of development opportunities, often quite precisely identified, um, and also precisely identified the key reasons for which they had not been. So we could quite precisely identify what could be done. Uh, what would be the lever to make possible why the fishery, the, the production of fresh fish, or the, the diversification of, of these fishery activities what did not occur? So what would need to be done? Um, but still, a lot of very specific cases, so very difficult to emerge from this, oh, this is in general the type of policy that would be needed. The, the local situations are so specific. Uh, that you cannot say, well, there is a general need for more infrastructure, or there is a general need for higher education. Um, none, no, no general lessons like that could emerge, which encourages and maybe uh, what we mentioned in this was more contract-based policy, saying what is needed is really more of a partnership, a contract between the state level and the local level to say, well, we see you have ambitions, you have certain ideas, we could come in and that help you solving this precise aspect if you invest in parallel to something else. The, these types of solutions are really what emerge as the, the way forward. Um, all, all workshops systematically also identified a number of market failures. So we always see resources that are not being exploited and that will not get exploited unless there is some kind of regulation. So there is a need for intervention um, but once again, the problem is that this intervention takes very different forms. Which also then implies that in some areas, um, you can ask, well, is it justified? Is the intervention, the intervention is needed, but is it justified with considering the expected, what the, the local stakeholders expect as an output? Now, the only case study, uh, of our case studies with this question really is, uh, emerged was Akunak the 100 inhabitants village, where there is really no export-oriented economic activity. Um, the inhabitants there, some of them are fishermen, but they all deliver the fish in other villages because they have no reception, they have no res uh, infrastructure to receive fish. So they're basically only living there, and the village um, has no economic function as such. So then can you ask which I know in, well, in Greenlandic policies obviously is an absolute taboo, but the question is the question of the, of the, just, of the justification of maintained population still emerges and need to be asked. Um, which of course this question appears very differently as soon as you have a village with an, a mobility, like in the Greenlandic villages where people can have daily commuting to another village where you can discuss, well maybe you have no um, uh, maybe the economic activities seen in isolation uh, would not justify, but they have other f uh, other functions like health services, um, education, um, living environments that in, in interaction with nearby towns would justify a uh, maintained settlement. Um, with this increasing mobility, strictly opposing villages and towns, the smaller and larger settlements is not meaning, meaningful in all, in, in all the case study areas we had. The main limiting factor for, um, for local development is um, recurrently attractiveness for qualified persons. So the, it's not the lack of opportunities, it's really the lack of persons that, that, uh, that reduces the, the development perspectives. Um, but local preconditions pre pre are extremely different. You have been mentioned today the fact that uh, Borgadbygd has two universities or two university colleges, while uh, the um, Greenlandic uh, village of Ikarasak would like to have a, a junior high school, would like to have education up to 10th grade. So, of course, you have like, enormous differences between the villages we have been considering. The other recurring issue was access to risk capital. So the fact that um, investors, those that have the capital, simply do not understand or do overestimate probably the risk. Um, they do not manage or want to have the necessary resources to, to consider the risk um, that, uh, of the, the, the economic initiatives that these um, uh, local stakeholders propose. Um, but all the discussed solutions in that, those that have already been emerging, the Faroese uh, proved difficult to implement. The Faroese had been discussing for, I think, five, ten years um, a joint uh, type of, of uh, uh, 
municipalities coming together with local stakeholders to make some kind of investment um, uh, body, but um, didn't manage to implement it because of, of, uh, of different and diver diverging interests among the stakeholders. And the Greenlandic stakeholders certainly were keen to underline that the state was a hopeless investor, that this trying to take international authorities as, an, as a replacement investment did not function. So this is probably the key challenge. Um, and finally, um, the, the, diff the cases show that uh, local economies based on natural resource exploitation can develop in many different directions. Um, Fiatla Bygd, um, with this new, tr uh, this new uh, transport uh, con uh, infrastructure to Akureyri, uh, can be become a harbor for fresh fish export with considerably larger market values. This, the, the, um, the same resource being, being taken in, but with a much higher external market value. Um, they also envisage to um, develop harbor services for northern Iceland and East Greenland. Um, so services associated with the natural uh, resource exploitation. While in Greenland, we main, they mainly talked about how to diversify um, the fisheries activities in order to build a more resilient economy. And then the key factor would be the, the harbor capacity during winter, because these, these uh, fishery um, uh, villages are um, totally isolated in winter, so the only way of, of, of uh, selling the fish is yet you need to store it in, in appropriate uh, uh, storing facilities. And also in Greenland, the other the issue for, for resource exploitation is the, the monopoly of, of Royal Greenland in this purchase. Um, finally, the, the other recurring issue in these foresight workshops were the, um, the need to address power relations and the the uh, existing elites and how they are constraining development perspectives. Uh, villages are generally described as conservative, but at the same time, the villages often also defend the idea that the uh, local ambitions and ideas are not taken into account at national authorities, by national authorities and investors. So there's quite a contradiction between the perception of conservative villages, but the idea also that their, their, their initiatives are not taken into account. Um, so overall, the dialogues with the local level um, can be difficult in, in interactions with these power or constraining power relations, but um, the experience from the workshops indicated that the foresight methods could help overcoming these difficulties. Um, of course, our perspective on this was a bit biased by the fact that we came in and they, the, the participants knew that there was no immediate political implication. What they were telling us, the types of ideas they were, would not have an impact on whether they would get a subsidy or whether this or that policy would be implemented. And coming in, if you imagined and reproducing this approach from an, by an authority, this dialogue would probably have taken a quite different shape. So there is a challenge there in how to organize these dialogues in a way that uh, some <laughs> allows a free, a fr uh, fr uh, open, open and free dialogue. Um, the the self perceptions came came back also as as playing a key role in development perspective. So the, the fact that these many of these villages with decades of population decline have difficulties projecting themselves in a, in a future because they, are all, they only see this as a constant struggle of trying to, to, to stay afloat, if, uh, to not, to be, not to disappear, especially the smallest ones. So trying to, the projection in some, in some desired future is quite difficult. As has also early, been mentioned earlier today, isolation is described as an asset in many respects, this protection of isolation, this capacity of isolation to, to preserve um, and to, to um, in this process of, of decline, to, to at least try to, to reduce the pace of the decline by maintaining certain key services that would disappear if you become more accessible. But to overcome all of these aspects, what really seems important is to try to go from this idea of village life as something that is, um, that is uh, uh, imposed on them to something that is chosen. 
And that implies also taking the, the, the implication of it, that you will not have the same health and education and uh, private services in these villages. This is a choice of, a choice of lifestyle, not, not a, an imposed lifestyle. Um, so a more explicit positions, more explicit national dialogue, important when you bring up at national level, saying, okay, village life implies that the expectations in terms of services are not the same, but that there are other qualities in terms of local environments, in terms of, um, uh, in terms of quality of life, in terms of uh, social cohesion. Um, so, um, factors that help in that becoming, becoming um, um, well, trying to get clarity in this implies that you have a more of a, de a defined project. It's not the same thing for a village within commuting distance becoming an attractive commuting area for urbanites and becoming a hotspot for tourism or um, remaining if, or, or developing into a fisheries, hunting, agricultural society. And this clarity in the differentiation of objectives was something I think we, we had the, the beginning of in these workshops and we could certainly be further um, detailed, further specified, and would be really the basis for, um, um, for, well, for a future-oriented policy in these areas. So overall, the generally, I would say the foresight workshops, um, they did create an arena for open dialogue and consensus building that appeared much needed. So there was really, we felt that coming into these communities, we, we are filling a need. And, and this, maybe the prob main problem was that we also felt that we created an expectation of what, what, what comes next. So it was a bit difficult to explain to them, well, was, this is a, test, a pilot. Um, we certainly think that systematizing these type of approach could improve the capacity of the of the local communities to face future challenges but it's very important to think what would be the appropriate framework and disconnecting this from very direct policy making it would be a great mistake i think to go into this again and say oh we have now a big pot of money and we're going to distribute it depending on the result of uh, foresight workshops i'm sure that would create a lot of um, problems <laughs> rather than solutions so um Getting policymakers to accept that this maybe we need to take this a bit open and without being too hurrying too much from knowledge to um, to implementation. But as I explained, this was a quite a complex process. We had I didn't describe all the details. We had training workshops in work, Copenhagen with the people that organized the workshops locally. We had uh, we had the, the, the messages being then reported back. Uh, um, Transnational level really seems like the level to do this. There is no competence in uh, many of these areas to organize for foresight workshops locally. And developing that kind of a competence uh, seems very appropriate to do at the transnational level because there are, well, it's not such a widely shared type of competence. And um, so the transnational level seemed quite useful. Of course, language is a challenge, but I, we, we, um, well, we over, was, it was possible to overcome it with appropriate resource persons in the different countries. So this was a description of I wanted to make of these processes. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Do you have any questions for? Please. Yes, um, I like your concept of chosen village life. Um, in, in a way, I mean, suggest that maybe people are no more or less forced to live in villages, but now they can, they can choose. If they're okay, I have to, um, as you also said, accept more limited service provision. Maybe that's a consequence of doing that. <coughs> I think in the long term, in the long run, that would run counter to social cohesion. Uh, could be. Anyway. <coughs> but I mean, I, I like the idea. But I was also thinking about this. I have been doing. Uh, regional foresight in Norway, I said, discussing with the <coughs> uh, local region within uh, the inland uh, in Norway. <coughs> and we also discussed quite a lot of things. What are, lack what, what are we lacking here? And it was probably some of the same thing you, you mentioned too, that qualified workforce, risk capital, etc., etc., better roads, and so on and so on. <coughs> uh, and all the effort was doing again how to to stabilize this society. <clears throat> I was thinking about, is it possible that it could even prevent some transformation <clears throat> when you, when you in, in these discussions? 
I mean, they, 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 we have a trend for centralization, urbanization. These are, many of these are marginalized societies. <coughs> Could it be thinking that <coughs> society, when we're really discussing that, <coughs> no, I think we have to give it up here. If, if, if you couldn't increase accessibility, <laughs> but let's in a long, long run say, let, let's relocate whatever it takes. Yeah. But I mean, to, to break out the maybe the, the frames for this special society is not there. I mean, you will never have a discussion like that, I think, but it could be interesting to, to think that way. I I, I, I did mention that we need to raise the point. So at some point, we need to ask, okay, what should we consider that this community may be, that you, the, the, the project is not realistic? There is no, you talked about coherence of scenarios. You, there, you, you, we, in the discussions, we do not come up with a scenario that actually is coherent in different perspectives. Um, it's very delicate. You can, you, at least we will definitely not come into one of these local communities and, and come to that conclusion. Um, but that's why maybe I come up with this idea of a contract-based policy, of saying a policy that where the state says, okay, I, can, I, I, I try to make a process where I allow you, I empower you to, to formulate a project and to say, okay, we could do this, but we need that. And, and that's the type of basis for, for the next step. The, you go in, if you believe in that, you go in and you find the private public stakeholders. Um, so I think that would be the key. Now, the question is, of course, what does this empowerment mean? Some will, of course, be more empowered than others. Some are already more empowered, so you cannot recreate a total balance. Um, but that's, yeah, it, it is somehow the key. But the more, the idea is only we are still, as you say, the centralizing trends are enormous. What we're doing here is trying to say, can we try to save something of the settlement patterns that exist because there may be values associated with them? And in that process, I think trying to empower as many as possible to formulate something helps. Now, I, maybe the picture I drew was a bit pessimistic. I, Ikerasak in Greenland of, is a very optimistic community. They have a very um, prosperous uh, uh, fisheries activities, which they are 250 inhabitants, but this is functioning well. Um, so it doesn't take much for a community to, to be in a process where they, they, with a little bit of help, I mean, they already have a positive attitude, a bit of tools to try to think how they could further develop. This is easily done. Um, so, well. Uh, so. <laughs> Just to comment on that, I think the, for the economic activity, yes. I think for all kinds of services mm. they need, I think the problem is more there. So, yeah. Possibly, yes. Are there any other questions? I have a, <laughs> a question of an inquisitive mind. Uh, one of the things that you, uh, you touched upon towards the end, you, you answered my question a little bit. But uh, I was involved in economic development in the Arctic, and uh, we didn't call it foresight at that time. It was back in the 90s. But it was specific towards tourism. And we wanted to get input from the, uh, from the local small villages, what they, what they viewed. And <clears throat> it was very hard to manage the expectations. And once we managed the expectations, it was very hard to get them engaged in the process. And I was just wondering maybe if you can elaborate a little bit more. Uh, you know, did it work well for you? Did you have a specific way of getting around that? I mean, we were telling them basically at the end of the day that the federal government was trying to develop a strategy for development of the tourism industry in some of these small Arctic communities, and we had to identify, you know, what was going to be the best thing. But there was no guarantees at the end of the day that this was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so it was very hard to, you know, they thought we're coming in, we're going to have yeah. all this tourism, and then they thought, oh, we're not, well, then what are we doing here? So how did you, <laughs> how did you manage that? Uh, it's extremely diverse. The thing is, the communities are very diverse. Um, now, Fiat Labig, you've heard about that. When we had the workshops, they didn't or they hadn't seen how big the tourism wave was going to be. So it's, it's I think it, um, and now they have enormous investments apparently. So um, in Greenland, certainly that was a bit the attitude. Okay, what's? Please bring the tourists. <laughs> Where are they? <laughs> um, in in Fair in the Faroe Islands, there was a bit more. 
elaborate because they are more in a waiting position. They would like to get more tourists coming, but they have been thinking, some of them have been thinking quite a lot about, they already have some products, but they have the issue of how to get people to the Faroe Islands. And then if they can only get to Tours Hof, then <laughs> Uh, they can get them out. So the, the discussions were at very different levels. Um, but did they have confidence that this was going to work for them? I mean, did, how, how did you? The, I, I, many of the attitudes in some, well, in many of the attitudes of many participants was a bit naive. Um, this would be great. We just need, just need to bring them in, and we'll this will we'll take care of, we'll it. Take care of it somehow. Uh, and this seeing the, the tourism as a quite a complex issue that that's quite tricky. Um, I didn't touch on that. We, we discussed with the entrepreneurship in relation to that. One of the, one of the, actually, I, I well, at the transnational meeting, we tried to ex extract what would the lessons be, what type of project could we now implement transnationally, and one of them was to organize some kind of itinerating tourism school. So having three months uh, courses in each of the countries and making people circle around to get experience because the levels of um, experience with tourism are so different and the complementarities are quite great between what's going on in Greenland, Iceland, Faroe Islands. So this was one of the ideas we came up with, training in tourism management, um, well, hospitality type of uh, what does it imply, um, uh, tourism concept design. Um, so that was one of the, the projects that somehow came up as an idea when we lifted this up at the transnational level. And have they been implemented? Well? That has not yet been. That's not one of the two projects that we <laughs> have gone on with. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, thank you for this interesting lecture. Uh, I was thinking, because you have been talking about this workshop, mm. uh, how did you uh, choose the people into mm -hmm. that. I mean, did you take by gender or mm. some age, or did you try to get like from 18 up to mm -hmm. 80, or, or how? No, it, it was really it was really a balancing act. Um, yeah. You do not approach an Icelandic municipality as you approach a Greenlandic village. <laughs> so it's quite a different thing. Um, I think for the Icelandic, in the Icelandic case, it was really the expert knowledge of the, the organizer coming in, knowing the village, and then letting it evolve a bit naturally, and then adjusting the selection. But it was not a scientific process of, uh, of selection. Um, in the villages, it was more the, you know, you go through the elders, it was... Um, yeah, uh, but still, generally, we had a quite a good balance between age groups, uh, genders mostly, not always. <laughs> um, so this came up nat quite naturally. We had relatively balanced groups. Now, this could we would of course have to reorganize workshop maybe with a different group to see how different the messages would be. Um, but I think that's what I said. I think that's what really one of the assets of these communities, even if we come up to 3,000 inhabitants, we're still at the, at the size where you can feel you bring together 20, 30 person, you're already starting to get quite um, a sense of the types of attitudes in the, in the area, which in the town of 20,000 is extremely different. And, and that's what maybe one of the key messages, why you, are, you have this particular com advantage, and that is... <laughs> really not being being used by the authorities. Um, so I'm not sure I really answered, but it was it was a bit of test. Um, okay. <laughs> Good. Anyone else? Yes. I think that was really one of the core elements of the of the the training in methods. <laughs> That's precisely that. How do you create a context around the table so that everyone is invited to speak? Either you, you go around it, you let met, ensure everyone is going around, you give everyone you know post-its to vote for ideas, so everyone has the post-it, <laughs> well, whoever it is, or you ensure that even persons that uh, dividing up in smaller, making people work in th three persons 
A lot of people will talk when they are just three, they will never talk if there are ten. So all of that was really what we thought through and went through in great detail in the training workshops in Copenhagen before the local workshops. Uh, maybe, did you have a, a comment on, <laughs> on that? Yeah, it really worked well. We, we, uh, this training was very successful in Copenhagen. And yeah, I'm from the Iceland part of the group. <laughs> and, uh, and we addressed them directly to those who were very passive, so mm. sometimes, but mostly we use the rounds, we take them around and we make them, uh, let them knew that they were, uh, they would be, uh, yeah, mm. need some pressure, yeah, a small pressure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There are very basic methods of just simply, you know, someone says something, you write it up. You validate what has been said. You ensure that this is up on the screen, it, it will be taken on. Uh, trying to ensure then that, okay, whoever, even if you speak very loudly, it's still written on the on up, but not any greater, not in greater fonts <laughs> than the person who speaks very carefully. Uh, so there are very basic methods, but they need, still need to be learned, and, and I think many it is very real, generally ignored. I mean, you organize these mass meetings and you think, okay, let the people speak. <laughs> but uh, that's not really the way it works. So, yeah, it's really one of the core um, challenges. It's good not to get confrontational. Yeah, th that's also very important. All methods, we, we do not, these workshops, we have four or five hours with local community. We do not, we cannot take in uh, uh, debate. We are here to bring up, okay, you have a dis disagreement, very well, we write it up. We note you, you, there are groups with different diverging opi opinions, but that is not going to be solved here. So, yeah, all these elements, that was part of the method. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much, Eric. Thank you very much. Don't forget, we have the reporting on the various sessions at 405, and then the wrap up session after this. Thank <laughs> you.